Hello and welcome to the Alpha Anywhere demo and Q&A session. My name is Dave McCormick from Alpha Software. I'm pleased to present Dion McCormick, no relation, who is our lead solutions engineer coming to us from Austin, Texas. Uh, hello, Dion. Are you there? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Excellent. So we'll begin our session today. Just a couple things for everyone to know. We encourage you to ask questions. Please do so by typing them into the questions box of the GoToWebinar uh, interface. You can ask your questions at any time. Now is as good a time as any, though. So uh, just type in what you've got, and, and we'll see if we can get to it. If we can't answer it today, we will either answer it the following session or get back to you by email uh, it, uh, as soon as the session is out. Uh, the other thing is that this session will be recorded. And a copy of the recording can be found at videos.alphasoftware.com. So let's begin. How's it going, Dan? Doing great. Doing great. Excellent. Let me go ahead and make go. you the make you the presenter here. And Dion, you should see a dialog box to click on. Yep. It should be coming up right now. Okay, it's coming through. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. We know you have a lot on your plate and you have a lot of things to do, and we always enjoy. This is about you. You can help us out by asking questions in your GoToWebinar control panel. There's questions available. Also, at any time uh, during the week, you can send questions to guides, G-U-I-D-E-S, at alphasoftware.com and those we can prepare and be prepared in fact I've got a couple that uh, were sent in and Dave's prepped me so I can answer those and those turn out to be very efficient because it gives us a little homework time to make sure everything's working but we want to say thank you very much please get those questions in uh, now and during the week and with that uh, I'd like to start out real quick before we have a demonstration uh, this will be the last segment of our notifications discussion uh, before we were showing how it was working in the grid now I want to show you how to use a technique in the UX which is very powerful and I think you'll really enjoy so we'll get to that in a few moments but before that I want to remind everybody that coming up next month Alpha DevCon 2015 September 16th through 18th uh, this is going to be an amazing event. It's going to be something that you will walk away with an enormous amount of new knowledge, capability, and new ability to solve problems that you didn't have before for two reasons. One is a whole new set of technologies are rolling out, the new clipboard capabilities, and there will be a lot of sessions on that to start getting you up to speed on that. It will dramatically enhance your mobile interfaces. I can't wait. I'm just so excited about it myself because it will transform uh, the mobile interfaces to just world-class interfaces and allow you to do very unique things at, in an easier, faster, and simpler manner. Also, you're going to meet people and developers and other individuals who will become uh, incredible resources for you over time, specifically the ability for you to reach out and talk to people about what you're doing, get ideas, bounce ideas and stuff. So you'll really, really enjoy it. So I highly recommend it. In fact, uh, man, I'll tell you, I don't know what's up with uh, airfares, but I was able to get 200 bucks round trip on JetBlue from Austin to Boston. So the cost, for whatever reason, on uh, airfares are pretty low in the September time. Maybe everybody's finished uh, traveling. They want to bump their usage, but get those booked now. You can go to the home page of Alpha Software. Let me go over here to Alpha Software. And if you look up here, where is it? Where did you, where'd you guys put it? It was up here in the right-hand corner. Uh, it was. That's our new thing. So just go to uh, yeah, all of our events can be found in the events menu. There we go. Just go to the bottom here yep. of the home page and click conference details. And this is going to take you to the conference details. And you can watch last year's recap and register now. But I highly recommend it. Again, it's one of those things that I considered an investment versus an expense because every time I go to this, I walk away with new capabilities, new opportunities, and skills that really enhance what I do. So highly recommend it there. So, and one, uh, one last thing I'd like to point out oh, yes, is sir. that our our chance to get inexpensive hotel rooms right now, I think it's like 150, uh, is going to be disappearing pretty soon. So if you're thinking about it, you're probably best to do it uh, this week. I think. Monday Monday might be the last day for the for the good. Yeah, rates. and uh, well worth so it. Just, a lot of uh, logistics. Yeah, life will be easier logistically with that. It will so. be if you're in the same hotel as the conference, right? Exactly. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, okay, so with that, I want to go ahead and wrap up our notifications uh, for folks that haven't been with us the last few times. We started that a little ways ago, but the idea behind it is that you often have a requirement in a application, whether it's mobile 
or if it is in a web-based desktop browser kind of scenario to notify users. And you want to have that done proactively by the system. So instead of, uh, you know, a situation where the user has to take a specific action to go find information, you want to be watching critical information, critical KPIs, critical things, and bringing those notifications to the user. So the question is, well, how do I do that? How can I have a system that handles that for me? So we created first, and I'm going to jump over here for people who are new. I'm jumping over to the alpha development environment, and I am at the web projects control panel. You can see I have a bunch of them in here already, and I've already created a couple examples. So I'm going to go ahead and open up our uh, notification grid. Now, last time we looked at it, what we did is, and I'll just actually show you a quick live preview of how this works, is that the grid can be used as a notification tool. Specifically, you can use uh, highlighting and also built-in images that will change based upon the information in the background. And what's neat about this is that by using a technique called an on-timer event, uh, basically a refresh event that is done automatically by the system, as you change back in data, the grid will refresh and it will update this information for you. Uh, and again, the way we do that is we use, in our fields, we use conditional formatting and I believe it's on here. We use conditional styles that are watching another field or another parameter, and based on what they see, they change the highlighting of that. And so that's going to be applied automatically by the system. But then in the properties section, if I kind of scroll down to the bottom, let me go all the way down to the bottom, and go to the auto refresh grid. It's a powerful function here. When you enable it, you can give it an interval in seconds. So in this case, 10 seconds could be you know longer than that. The grid will automatically refresh for you. And therefore, if any changes occurred between the time of the last refresh and the new refresh, the grid will automatically update the look and feel, either changing an icon. Oops, let me go to live preview, a little easier to see. Uh, live preview here, or, you know, or uh, I'm sorry, conditional formatting or you can actually have icons that change. You notice there's like a little circle that goes around my little icon every 10 seconds or so. That is the system making the callback. And what's really powerful about that is the system is very efficient in terms of it's not reloading the whole page. All it's doing is grabbing the changes and then applying them on the front end in a very efficient manner. The only thing I like to uh, sort of caution people is that uh, this does take server resources, so each time it's making that callback to the server, it is uh, you know, uh, interrupting the server saying, hey, I need some updates here. So if you had a 1,000 people doing this, then you've got to be a little careful you're not overwhelming your server with updates. Uh, but there are strategies you can use to space people out, and it depends also how often do they need to be updated. Is it every minute? Is it every five minutes? Is it at once a day? You can kind of make those decisions there. Now. I want to go ahead and finish up our example today by going in and showing you how you would accomplish the same thing with the UX control. And where this is kind of interesting is that obviously the UX control is more of our form control. So for people who are new to alpha, uh, this is a grid component. It's more of a historical, kind of heavier weight, very powerful component. But we also have what's called a UX builder, which is our form control. And this allows you to build forms. And the powerful thing about UXs is, is they're divine, they're excuse me, designed from the ground up to be used both on web desktop and mobile. So if you're building mobile interfaces, you're going to be using the UX control to do so. So let me go ahead and show you an example of what's going on here. So I'm going to go ahead into live preview and do a full preview here. So you'll notice I have just a little little uh, text box that says green right there. That's a text box. And a icon right here that is either green or red. Now notice what's happening. Every five seconds, this is changing. So when it changes from green to red, you'll notice that the icon changed from green to red, and then when the notification goes to green, it changes the icon to green. So it's a very simplistic example of it, but I wanted to kind of walk you through how this is working to kind of give you notice. So you notice every five seconds or so, my little cursor is doing a little roundy round thing, and then it's updating the value of this field right here, and the, the icon is changing here from a red to a green. So imagine that instead of a very simple where I'm just switching it one to two, 
and I'll show you how to do this in the background. You could be querying a database. You could be making a web API call. You could be doing anything. And then based on that information, feeding back an update to highlight certain icons to show or hide alerts and things along those lines. So this is a very simple, and I'm going to walk you how, how walk you through how I built this so you'll get an idea of how to. And remember, if, it, if I go a little fast, and I apologize, I tend to get going and get excited. Uh, we do record these, and these will be up and recorded, so you can always go back and watch them uh, once again. So, and, and again, if anything really missed it, something doesn't make sense, please reach out to us at guides at alphasoftware.com and uh, let us know. We'll make sure to get you the information. Uh, before I go into that, I'd like to ask Dave, everything coming through okay? Voice, yep. video? Audio is okay. good. Video is good. Yeah, I upgraded my – everybody, I upgraded my uh, – my network now, so I think I have a little bit more solid environment based on there. So, so I'm going to go into my uh, UX builder, and again, for people who are new to Alpha, this is our form. And you'll notice on the left hand side, I had a, a set of different types of controls, maps, charts, text box, text areas. In the middle, I have the structure of my control or of my UX component. That means kind of how things are laid out in the screen. And for people who are new, sometimes that's a little confusing because it's like, well, wait, why don't we have drag and drop? Well, the reason why is this could be working on a web desktop, a tablet, a phone, a phone with high screen distancy, a density, a screen with not. So we use a different structural way to apply that there. Now, the components you're going to see in here is I first have a text box. That's that text box up top, and then I have two containers, container number one and container number two. And so you'll see in here that inside each of these container, I have an image. So basically, I have my green image here, and I have my red image here, and each one of these is inside a container. And this is a very simple way. There's other ways to do this, but a very simple way to do this. Now, the way I show and hide the individual one is I've set a rule. So if I look at the container here, and you'll notice on the right-hand side I can see my parameters for that container here, you'll notice that for container number one, I have a client side properties show hide expression. Now, there's two of them here. Show hide server side is what happens when you're on the server before this is served up to the user. Client side happens actually on the local web browser or the mobile device. So you want to try and stay as much as possible on client side because then everything is local and fast and you're not hitting the server. But you'll notice I have something here called show hide expression. So let me go ahead and double click on that and open it up and I'll move this over here. So you'll see I have a little formula that says notification variable is equal to green. So remember we had our notification variable that was that text box up top. And it defaults to green and it says if the value of that text box is equal to green, show this container. And thus, we have a little embedded green image in there. So when this container is shown, the user will see the green image. Now let's go over here to container number two. I selected container number two. I'm going over to the client side properties, show height expression. And you'll notice then the rule here is, notification underscore variable is equal to red. So now this container says, hey, if I see red in notification underscore variable, then I will show myself. Otherwise, I'm going to stay hidden. And that's the power of this is that once I've set up these rules, I don't have to worry about things. I just have to set the value of notification variable to either green or red, and the system will automatically show and hide those containers and update for them. And this could be much more sophisticated. This could be uh, not just an image, but some data fields, a pop-up window. I mean, there's really any, this, the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do. But it's a very simple concept where I have a text box that's on my user interface. And in that text box, I have a value. And then I use these other containers to look at that value to say whether it's red or green. So let me show you how that works real quick. So you'll notice when I start this, my value is green, and I'm just going to type in red real quick and hit tab. Notice how the moment I changed it to red, it turned to red. Now, my little script is running in the background to switch it back and forth, but you'll notice that now if I go in here and type green, it automatically showed that. Notice how fast that was. There was no flashing of the screen, no blinking. It's all done with JavaScript, and on these local devices, especially mobile devices, it is instantaneous as far as the user can do. And you can apply animation and other pieces there. Now, so that's how I'm showing and hiding this little identification here. And again, if I wanted to, I could hide this whole piece behind the scenes 
and the user would only see the icon here. Now let's get to the meat of it. Okay, so I have my method in which I can show and hide a icon or alert to the user to uh, whether it's green or red based on this value here. Now what I want to do is every once in a while I want to review what the status of my system is and then update this notification variable. So first thing I did is I created and I'm going to go into my JavaScript action areas. I created a JavaScript action called Ajax callback. And I'm going to walk through this. And again, if I go a little too fast or you miss something, please just get up the video uh, and you'll, it'll walk you through it. You'll be able to walk through it again. So I've created this JavaScript action called an Ajax callback. And what that is, is that this little piece of JavaScript makes a call back to the server, looks at things, and then returns data back to the mobile device or the desktop. In fact, I have a little image of it here, is that on your mobile device or your desktop, there is an Ajax callback that makes a call over to the server. The server reviews that information and then sends back commands back to the browser. So in my case, what I'm going to do is in this Ajax callback, I'm going to look at what the current state of notification variable is. And based on that, send a message back to the browser to update notification variable. And so it's called, and so I just called it Ajax callback. You can call anything you want. And it is an action JavaScript. And again, for people who are new, Alpha has these really cool capabilities called action JavaScripts that make it easy for you to write JavaScript. Behind the scenes, it's all JavaScript. But in our case, we can use point click. So I'm going to double click on this. And you'll notice that I have a little menu here. And all I'm doing is saying the function I want to call on the back end is called update status. So what this little JavaScript or what this action JavaScript does is all it does is when you run this Ajax callback, it will go back to the server, find the function update status, run that function, and then that function can return information back to it. So that's all there is to it. So I have my Ajax callback in here, and it's a very simple one. And the cool thing about it is that you don't have to write one of these for every control. You can actually modify multiple controls at one time. So you really only need one Ajax callback. So I'm going to go ahead and I've got that Ajax callback. Now what I'm going to do is go into X basic functions. This is where that function lives that I created. And so when I click on X basic functions, you're going to see up here function update status. That's the name of it. So this will live on the server. So when I deploy this, what will happen is the application server will send the user interface with the text box, the containers, and the images down to the browser or the mobile device. It will keep that function over here for me automatically, so it does all that. I don't have to tell it or anything like that. So what's going to happen is when the uh, Ajax callback happens, it then grabs that, goes to the function that's over here and comes back and updates things. So I'll walk you through it. So all I do is this, is I say, I have a very simple statement. I say, if e .data submitted notification variable, so that's saying if the value of that text box is equal to red, then I want to set the value of that text box to be green. Now notice the naming convention is a little different. We have e.data submitted holds all of the current state of all the controls on, on the, the UX control out in the field. And so I can query those and say, hey, what is sitting in that text box? Oh, if it's red, then I can run this little command that will say, go ahead and set that now to be green. Now, if it is green, it's going to go ahead and set that to be red. And when I do this, what's really powerful about Alpha is that Alpha will review this information, write the little JavaScript necessary to make that modification, and send that JavaScript back to the browser and mobile device to make the changes as necessary. So in this case, what it's going to do is it's going to ask, okay, what is that uh, little text box? What is it? Is it red or is it green? So this function over here looks at that and says, oh, it's red. It needs to be green. So what I'm going to do is create a little piece of JavaScript that I'm going to send back to it. And that's why they call it an Ajax callback because the server sends back a little piece of JavaScript that just simply changes the uh, – the value of that text box to the new state. And it does all that for you. You'll notice that I'm not writing any uh, JavaScript. It is translating these little things into JavaScript for me and handling all the communication back to it. 
So if I go back to my live preview and we watch what's going on, currently this little text box has green. So when the Ajax callback fires, which it's doing automatically here, it took the value of this, this text box here, sent it to the server. The server looked at that, which all happens to be on my machine, and said, oh, it's red. Okay, it should be green, and then sent back a little piece of JavaScript that did there. And then when this little text box changed, you'll notice that it automatically on this client side said, oh, I've got to change which container is visible. So that's how that Ajax callback. Now, here's one other key piece of information. You'll notice when I'm running this that it's doing it automatically. So much like the grid, you could set sort of a timer event. So what we do is on my UX, I go to the properties, and then I go to – it's called on timer. And for people who are new, if you're trying to find that, you just click on this properties button and start typing what you're looking for. And you can see it has on timer event. When you click on there, it takes me down here. So if you look closely, we have something that says has on timer event, and that's a yes or no. And then it says what is the event interval, i.e., in seconds, how often should I do this? So basically I'm saying, hey, you know, what I want to do is every so many seconds, I want to do an on timer event for this UX. Now what I need to do is I go into the uh, client side events over here. And there is an on-timer client-side event. So basically, that property says, hey, run any JavaScript that's in here on a interval timer. And so I'm going to go ahead and delete this to show you how it's easy. So I've created my Ajax callback. So I can click here and say, action JavaScript, insert code to run a JavaScript action. There's my Ajax callback. And you'll notice it put a little piece of JavaScript in here. So what's going to happen is, since I set the property of has on int timer event equal to true and on timer event interval is five seconds, every five seconds it is going to run the JavaScript that's in this on timer event. And in this case, all it's going to do is run that callback. So therefore, every five seconds it's going to make a callback to the server to check and see what's going on there. And that's how it's working here. So when I'm in here, the whole – and I'll tie it up here. You have a value of here. When the Ajax callback occurs, the function on the back end looks at the value of here, switches it, sends that back to this uh, front end, changes that, and then based on that, I'm changing the containers. But you could do many other things that you wanted to. You could set other text. You could, again, show hide windows. You could do update a map. You could have, actually have a map control and then automatically update it. It's the, the sky's the limit in terms of what you want to do. So the components are fo the following. First is that I have a way of telling the user interface what I want to do with this notification variable. Then I've set up behaviors with the containers there. I've set up a action JavaScript to do the callback to my backend function. And then in my backend function here, I've decided what I want to do, and then I send back to the user interface what I want to change. And then last but not least is I've set up a on timer event with a specific interval there. And then in my client side events, I've just put in the little command to uh, call that Ajax callback. So a few different pieces together, and I know first time through it may be, whoa, wait, what happened there? It, it will make sense. And the cool thing about this, and this is what I find very, very powerful. Once you kind of set this up, it's very easy to enhance, modify, and change, meaning that this is sort of a design pattern on how to accomplish this thing. The cool thing about it is once I've done that, I can go into my X basic function, and this is a very simple – all it's doing is looking at red and changing it to green or there. But in here, I have the full power of X basic. I could query a database and look at a current database and see if any values have changed. I could make a web API call to a whole other system and get some information there. And then based upon that information, send commands back to the front end to say, okay, change my graph to be this or change my icons to be this. Uh, the sky's the limit. Again, it's very, very powerful. And once you have it in structure, it's very simple. Now, where I've used this most often is that if anybody used, has used a tab UI, and I wonder if I have a tab UI in here. Let me see here. Ah, okay. Let me open up this tab UI and give you an example where I put that information. I, and this one's a – an example, so it doesn't really show you. But for people who have used a tab UI, the structure of tab UI is up top here. You have sort of a header piece. You have your buttons on the left and then your content right here. So what I will do is I will either put 
the a, uh, a UX control up here with my icons and notification. And so basically I insert that UX I just created here so that they have essentially up top a set of alerts or KPIs. Or what I do is instead of a, just a simple HTML homepage, on the first page right here I put updated information. I like it up here in the top portion primarily because if I open up some other things here, this part is unobscured, so you'll always be able to see those updates. And so every once in a while, the thing will automatically update, and then you'll see your icons change. And those alerts can be used by the people, whoever are using this solution, to say how to go there. And then in a mobile situation, usually what I set is in the header or footer, I have what's called a badge, which is like if I go back to uh, my little diagram here, you'll notice there's a little icon, and up here we have a badge. And that, that's a standard terminology. And what you can do is you can say, hey, if there's one thing outstanding, switch this icon to show the little people and a one or a two or a three. And all I'm doing is flipping different icons for the user to be seen. But they can see an alert occurred and also see the number of items. And then when they press on that, they go to a specific panel to go and address or do what they need to do on that. So this was a little bit longer of a demo, but I really wanted to take the time to walk you through it. So notifications, you can either use a grid or you can use, which is very powerful, in the UX system. Let me go to here. Uh, again, I can go in live preview. You can create a UX that automatically, periodically calls an AJAX callback looks at some information and then updates the user interface and again there's no action by the user so therefore this is a great way to have sort of proactive responses for your users so I hope you found that kind of interesting not too boring I hope I didn't lose you there uh, and uh, again go through the video and you'll hopefully make a lot more sense if you have any questions please let us know at guides at alpha software.com and speaking of questions uh, it would be great if Folks could go ahead and type in their questions. No question is too basic. Some questions might be too complicated, but we'll, uh, we'll try to do them anyway. Uh, but go ahead and type them in now into the questions box. This is really what these webinars are all about, is to help you out. So we did have a couple questions that uh, were mailed in. I don't know if you want if you want to get to those. Yeah, sure, sure, and, and uh, we'll come back if anybody has other kind of questions there. Excuse me. Okay. Questions. Uh, do you, or do so you want to go wanna, over them, or do you want me to go ahead on those two? Yeah, do you want to start with, uh, okay, yeah. there was a question about uh, doing some really simple JavaScript. You want to put in a button, and when you click on that button, all it does is add some predefined text into one of the input controls. On a Got it. Thank you. Um, in fact, great. I can look brilliant because we had this before our meeting, so I could be prepared and make sure it works correctly. So uh, with that, I'll show you an example of how to do that. So in this, in, so what you're looking for or what you're looking at here is a grid. So I have a grid component. And what I've done is I've connected that grid component to my customer's table using the standard methodology there. And then in my fields, I have highlighted and moved over my standard you know, fields that are in that table. But I did one other thing. I clicked insert, and you'll notice I have something here called a button, and I clicked OK, and it inserted a button here on my user interface. Now let me go ahead and show you what that looks like. So when I do my live preview, the grid will go ahead and render, and you'll notice that I have my data and it's editable, and then I have a button for each row right here. So now when I click this button, I want you to watch what happens to company name, okay? So you'll notice that the company name changed from whatever it was to Alpha Software. So what I did, and just to show you again so I don't lose anybody, I have a button here. When I click on that, it's gonna change the field value of company name to be alpha software. Okay, so let's look at that button. So these are just standard edit fields that are built into the field. So you can edit them, type into them, do everything. It handles all the updates and saves. But now I have a button here, and you'll notice on the button over here you have what's called a JavaScript on-click event. And you can see there's a bunch of other buttons that are available because this is for a button, but you know for a uh, text field you may want to fire a uh, 
when on blur is like when the control loses focus, like when someone tabs out of a control, you may want to run a little piece of JavaScript to do something. I've had that happen before, update a data value or do a verification or something like that. But for the, our purposes, we have a button here, and it's the on-click event. And what you do is you click the three little ellipses, and it brings up my JavaScript builder. Okay. So I'm going to show you how I did this. Basically, you can see what's going on here is that when a person clicks on this button, it's running a little piece of JavaScript that says grid.object set value, in this case, our company name for the current row number, that's grid.row number, it's going to insert what row I'm in there, it automatically detects that, the value of alpha software. Okay. So basically, this is a little piece of JavaScript that runs that basically when the person clicks on this button, depending on what row I am, it's row dependent, it will change the company name field just to be alpha software. Now, this could be more sophisticated. You could put in a time date stamp. You could do, uh, you could be looking up the current date and time. You could do a whole bunch of other things. So let me go ahead and show you how to do this. Now, I could have put in some action JavaScript, which would allow me a lot more capability of doing things such as launching UX controls, uh, uh, calling Ajax callbacks to do something. I mean, there's lots of different things you can do. But in this case, I'm doing a very simple example where it's all client side. Now, the question I get a lot is like, well, man, that's, hey, that looks complicated. But how did you find out which little function would do this? And that's where Alpha, again, has a real advantage. It's really built for people who are learning and who really want to just make their life easier. Because you can see down below, this is my editor, so I'm in the text edit mode, and I can just sit in here and start typing in JavaScript. You know, I can put in here and say uh, alert, hello, and if that happened, then when person clicked that button, it would throw up a JavaScript alert, hello. So, but the question is, how do you get something from there? So you'll notice down below, you have a set of text here that says insert grid method. And if I click on that, so I, when, I, when I got this question, I said, okay, I don't want to put a button and add a little JavaScript, but what JavaScript should I run? So I clicked on insert grid method, and it brings up this little sort of cheat sheet. And here are all the different JavaScript functions you can call. I mean, there's ton, animate, get state information, get rows in the grid, get the selected row. I mean, it's crazy here. And you'll notice that I can search for that. So I knew, I go, oh, you know what? I want a set of values. So I'm going to start typing in set. And you'll notice that it's already started to filter my things, anything that has set in it. So if I see it, I can just click on it and go, okay, yeah, that looks right. That's my get value, set value. Now, here's the other thing that's really cool is that alpha built into here has a built-in help system and examples. This is so cool. Makes your life so much simpler. So first, this is a description of what it does, and it's fairly robust. And it tells you, well, you know, if you're using checkbox or multi-value, you have to do a little differently, uh, some heads up, things like that. But the thing I like the most is down here we have what are called examples. So pre-made little examples for how to do this. And so I sit there and I click copy example to clipboard. I go back in here and I'm just going to type down and I'm going to go ahead and paste this. Now I paste it in the whole example. So it, it's showing you many different ways. You can set, like if you knew a specific row, uh, uh, you know, if you're updating the search part, etc. So you look through this and you say, you know what, this is the one I want right here. So I delete the things I didn't want. And so therefore, I have something that looks like what I had before. So it's basically saying, in the grid part, change this field. So I know that field is going to be company name. You'll notice that this grid row number is going to pull up whatever grid this was our row that was fired on. And then I can type in here, uh, alpha software. And boom, now I have my JavaScript ready to go. I can test it. I can put it in the system. And you'll notice that I didn't have to go research a bunch of books or anything like that. It's all built to it. And the magic of this was really in this insert grid method. It brings up a essentially a dictionary or library of all the different controls that you can do. And this is available anywhere you see the action JavaScript. So if you're doing, for instance, uh, something on a UX control where you want to set instead of a grid, you want to set a dialog text to something, then you'll see a similar set. You'll notice down here it says grid or UX. So this is all the different UX. Notice it's changed to dialog.object. 
but you can close container when you can get a panel object, you can reset the form, you can get a value. So this is uh, so you can see you can either pick grid or UX depending on if you're working on a grid or UX. And that's how I developed that. So when I got the question, the first thing I did was built a sample grid, then I added a button or inserted a button. And then on the on click event, I opened up my on click event editor, and then I used my insert grid method to research how I wanted to do that. And the cool thing about this is after you've done this for a few times, there's usually about five, ten different things you use all the time. There's five, ten different pieces of, uh, of JavaScript that you're always going to use. Uh, it just is kind of the nature where, you know, it's the Pareto rule. 80% of the things you need to do is with 20% of the actual commands, even though it's very rich commands. Once you start getting used to this, you're going to start remembering what those are. And so what you can do is you can start typing it in. So watch, this has type head. So I'm going to start typing this in. And you'll notice when I put in that little curly bracket, it automatically started doing autocomplete. So I go, oh, tab down, or uh, I'm going to use my down arrow to go to grid, dot, oh. Here's all my different things that I can select. I want object. Then I can click tab again, and guess what? Here are all the different uh, commands that are in there. Now, what's great is I don't have to use my down arrow. I can start typing, and you'll notice that it's done similar where it starts setting the item. So a great one is like set focus, etc. So then I can say, oh, okay, I want set value. And now look what it's doing. It's basically taken that help there and shown it right in here. So it tells you, okay. For the set value, the first thing I'm looking for is the great part. Is it a G, a D, or S? Is it the grid? Is it the detail view of the search part? So I go, okay, well, I want that to be a grid. So I'm going to go like that. Then notice when I put the comma, it tells me, well, which grid field name? So I go ahead. Now, I think this does it. Yep. And what's really powerful with that is that to help you even further, if you right-click, so what I'm doing right here is right-clicking on grid field name, Look at this. It's showing me all of the grid fields that are in my control. Notice they're over here. So I can say, oh, company name. And you'll notice that it automatically filled it out. This is really powerful because it, it really saves a lot of those little fumble finger errors that you get into. Then I have row, and then I can put on here grid dot row number. And then I can put comma the value, and in this case, I'm going to say alpha software. So there was two ways I built this. One way is, oops, I noticed it's red because I have a syntax error. One way was I was using the, uh, I was using the insert grid method, which I recommend starting out with. But once you kind of get used to what they are, then you'll find the type ahead or auto completion method turns out to be really, really fast and easy to use. And then all you have to do is save that. Oh, okay, I'm going to delete this because I want this out there. By the way, a little trick for people who aren't used to uh, the uh, JavaScript, if you hit two slashes, forward slash, forward slash, then everything after that will be commented out, and you'll notice it's in blue. So you can notice your comments up here in our blue. Then what's going to actually run is in green, and then we have some blue right there. So like if you say, oh, I want to adjust this, you know, a quick way to, do, to make adjustments is you copy it, you paste it, you comment out the first one, you say – super software, you know, and so you can use comments very easily. And the only thing that's going to run is in green. So we go and save that, go into live preview, and if I haven't destroyed anything, I click here, you'll notice alpha super software. So I, I appreciate that question because it allowed me to talk a little bit more about the built-in uh, JavaScript editor, which is very powerful, very robust, very rich, and has that really powerful way of you to kind of research the commands, uh, and often you just do a little research as there's great examples. You play with those, you'll be able to figure out in no time at all. And I'm using it in a grid here, but if you were developing a UX control, there's a, the same level of capability in the UX control that is in the grid. Excellent. Um, another question for you, uh, just going back to the tabbed UI genie, I had a couple of questions here, but you had mentioned that sometimes you'd like to yeah. insert a component, UX component, with your notifications up at the top of the tab. Ah, way. Could you tell us how you do that? Okay. So I'm going to go open my tab to uh, tab UI. And so you, when you open it, you basically you're adding your components in here, which will be your buttons. And the system will, and for people who haven't used the tab UI, it's a quick and dirty way to create an interface because these buttons now are just pointing at controls that are opened up in my 
different things. They could be reports, they could be grids, etc. however you want to do that. Now, the way you modify the look and feel of this is the following, is what you do is in you go into design, you click on the tabbed UI properties, okay? And don't get crazy, there's a lot of different properties because it gives you a lot of ways to modify, enhance, and change it here. But the one you want to look for is header text. Now notice that header text right here is H1 internal new note system. So it's a piece of basically a piece of HTML here. So what you can do is when I run this, let's say I go, uh, I'm going to type demo in there. When I run that, it's basically going to take this header text here, and you'll notice now, actually let me do live preview so it's a little easier to see, you'll notice that that now is a demo. So what I do is this, is that alpha, this accepts any alpha um, uh, command, uh, alpha like HTML, including, and this is very important, alpha script. So let me go ahead and show you how I do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in here, uh, alpha 5 has, and I'm going to go ahead and open up just to show you a little bit of how this works. I'm going to go in A5, and let's say I go to a blank page here. So bear with me. I'm just putting up a blank page. And I'm going to insert a little piece of a J JavaScript that's going to say uh, question mark hello world. Okay, so that's a little piece of what's called explicit scripting that says anything after the question mark in comments just throw out on the field or throw out on the page. So I click OK. You'll notice it has a little thing there. If I go ahead and, and do a live preview, notice that it just wrote hello world out there. Okay, so now if I go look at the source, basically all it did is it wrote a little piece of what's called action JavaScript here. Let me go ahead and do that here, which starts with a uh, caret uh, percent A5. That my alpha command, great. Yeah, I'm sorry, X basic. Not JavaScript, great. Uh, you're right. This is all X basic. Excuse yep. me. Excuse me there. So let's say, for instance, so if I grab this, let's go ahead and just grab this right here, and I copy this. I'll go back to my tab UI, and in here, I'm going to paste that in there. So, oh, and um, by the way, the pasting um, doesn't work. Or actually, you know what? Hold on here. Let's do this. Okay, I'm going to click my button over here, brings up an editor, and I can type in this right here. So notice I'm just in my header text. I'm just putting in this little piece of XBasic scripting. So now when I do a live preview, you'll notice something does two things. It put in the text I had, and notice it ran that little piece of action JavaScript, or not action, but X basic scripting. I apologize uh, for confusing you there. So the nice thing about that is I can put anything I want in here, and one of the most powerful capabilities you can do is you can put a little command in here that says include uh, my header dot A5W, I think it's in parentheses, my header dot a five w okay so the cool thing about this is that in my header here what I'm doing is literally using the editor to put in some HTML including both standard HTML and the X basic scripting but there's no reason why I couldn't just say in here instead of getting rid of this I could say include uh, header dot a five w Okay, so now what will happen is when this runs, instead of putting out text, it's just going to take whatever's in header A5W and display it in the header. And in that case, what I've done is I, in my header A5W, I've embedded my UX. So it's a little bit of a step-by-step, -step, but once you have it done, the cool thing about that is that you just put this piece of information right here, and then whenever you want to edit your header, you actually go to your UX, modify it there, and boom, it will automatically uh, put the A5W page and that UX in the header. So that's how I accomplish that is that instead of in my header text here inserting straight text, I put in a little piece of X basic script that includes a uh, – there. Let me, tell, let me do something here. Hold on a second, people. I want to make sure I'm giving you the right command. Um, alpha 5, A5W include. Let me make sure I use the right thing here. Ah, I did uh, – bear with me real quick. Okay. This is what it should be right here. So let me go back there, go back in here and put that. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so what's going to happen? So it's not include, it's A5W include. So what it does is that it will go grab this A5W page and just render it in here. So basically in my header text, instead of just fixed text, it will actually grab whatever's in that. So I could have an A5W page, but what I do is then I put into my header A5W, I insert a UX component that has all the alerts and everything else there. So what will happen is when this runs, it goes out and grabs the header page, which has included in it the UX, it renders all that, and then displays it to the user. And again, once you've got this set up, then all you have to do is go in and change that header UX, and the next time someone reopens this page, it re-renders that UX and re-renders your header. And that can, you know, since it's a UX component, you can get crazy. You can have, you know, data entry fields, you can have buttons, you can have actions, you can do anything you want. And it's a really quick and dirty way to make that header space up top more valuable and more functional for your users by using this technique. So I hope that's clear as mud. Excellent. Um, we did have sort of a more, I wouldn't say esoteric, but maybe complex question about using my, uh, parallels with uh, the remote test feature. I don't know if you had a chance to look into that. I yeah, uh, that basically, um, I'm a parallels user. I use that. So when I pop over here, I'm in Mac world. A show of hands to see who else uses a Mac computer. Is everyone here PC? Just a show of hands would be uh, do it. There's a there's like a hands up button on your uh, on your uh, thing if you want to say let's say I got one, I got two, three, four. Wow. Okay. It's like about 25 percent of you, roughly, from our informal survey, are are also Mac users who develop uh, Windows on your PC. Cool. Excellent. Cool. Anyway. Hey, there you go. The future is here. I know. I'll tell you, man. Yeah. You. If, again, the nice thing, the Macs are all SSDs, so they're super fast and really powerful. And actually, I've, I'm waiting for the new version of Parallels that's going to actually reduce battery and everything else be a little better. So looking forward to that. Um, but just to let you know is that if you go up to um, – when you're running Parallels, and I kind of go up to the top here, I now have uh, network – okay. So up top, the menu that appeared is Parallels Desktop. And you have two different modes in which – so basically you're running a virtual machine on your Mac. And so that virtual machine is going through parallels to grab access to the network, etc. And what I find is notice that I'm using shared network. So it, it depends on your environment, and it's a little trial and error for everybody. But by using shared network, basically both the virtual machine and my host machine, my Mac, are basically using the same – shared network. So therefore, basically, they're, they look like they're on the same network kind of scenario. The other mode is called bridge de uh, network, which I would set to a default adapter. And that puts it into a different mode where I think what it does, it almost creates a little subdomain and does some other things there. So the way I've worked it is that when I'm in shared network, I've found that's pretty reliable in terms of being able to do remote test. And for people who are new to this, what happens is if I have this UX, like, uh, let's go, uh, let me go ahead and open up my notification UX real quick. Uh, notification here, let's go, where is it? Uh, there it is, okay. There is a mode that you can do called remote test. So once you've built your system and you can use it in working preview and live preview, you can click this button up here called remote test. And what that does is that it will display a QR code with the URL of the test page. So I can click OK, pops up this UR co QR code, and then I can zap it with my mobile device, either tablet or phone, and then it will connect to my development machine as if it were a server and then run it on the mobile device. So what I find is that if you're using parallels, you have to kind of play with your network, either shared or bridged, one of those two modes. And then the other thing you can do when you remote test is down here you'll notice that I've set it to mode of display QR code, but you'll notice down here I have different ways of telling that thing how to connect. So I can say show IP addresses for my machine, and it shows the IP address. Well, that's the only one that's available, so that's most likely the best way for me to reach on my local network to there. Often, sometimes you could enter in a manual address or automatically based by my name, but I usually go to IP address and then do show IP address, and then once I've got that in there, I set it there and click OK, and boom, 
it worked there. So uh, the, there's no like simple answer other than do a little trial and error first with the networking mode inside Parallels by either using shared or, or bridged, and then go down here to IP address, show IP addresses, and play with the different IP addresses until you get the combination of the one that works. And once it works, leave it alone. It'll work great for all of your applications and systems there. So hopefully that gives you a little uh, heads up. Excellent. We have an offline question. Um, and the ah, question yes. is, does offline application need to be compiled into PhoneGap build? Does it need to be basically a PhoneGap application for the end user to be able to launch it in disconnected mode? Um, that's a really good question. I think the answer is yes. But once you're connected, then you can run in offline. So it's sort of like when you go to your login page, mm -hmm. it needs to log in and load the application into the web browser. Yep. Once it's loaded into the web browser, it's going to rain. Now, the other thing that's cool is that it will save session information between the times you log in. So uh, that's a benefit there. But I believe the answer, and we can double check, is that for a disconnected app that is deployed through the mobile web browser, not PhoneGap, you will need to be connected when you first log in because what it's going to do is download all of the HTML, CSS, and everything else to run disconnected, including the data. But once it's down, then you should be able to run it disconnected at that point in time. I believe that's the current. And that's one of the benefits of PhoneGap is that since it's an app, you've downloaded all that stuff up front as an app. And so therefore, all the system is doing is making essentially Ajax callbacks back to the system to, to the back office or back uh, server to update data and do things like that. So, Excellent. Um, just back to the network question. The question is, um, does the mobile device need to be on the same network as the computer for the remote test? That is correct, yes. It's assuming you're, uh, that they're both on the same network. So for instance, in my case, I have a Wi-Fi network here that this machine is connected to. My mobile device is there. Uh, so yes, for that remote testing. But you know, the other way to do it is just set up a Zebrahost server, click publish to, you know, you can set up a publishing profile and literally pl publishing, once you're in development, publishing to an external server is as fast as doing an almost remote test. But it's really up to you in terms of that. But um, yes, the answer is with when you're doing remote test, it's going to be looking for a local uh, network that you can connect on, like in your office or at your home or wherever it happens to be. Also, just to let you know, if anyone is interested in a Zebra Host account, I can get you a 30-day free account, no credit card or anything, with Zebra Host. And then after that, you know, if you keep using it, then you'll need to pay for it. But if you're interested, just send an email over to guides, G-U-I-D-E-S at alphasoftware.com, and I will get you set up with them. Yeah, and I would say anybody who's developing these things, if you haven't really done the external housing, hosting, take advantage of that. One thing is that uh, ZebraHost does a lot of heavy lifting, so when it's set up, it's set up right. So you don't you don't have to do a lot of arcane configuring services and everything else there. So you can focus more on just getting your app running on the service. But the other benefit is you can get uh, kind of comfortable with how to manage the external hosting environment because you need to know how to go in and uh, shut down, refresh, do other things like that. So it, it's really worthwhile, and that's it's really nice of those guys. They're really good. The neat thing is they set up the Zebra host or the alpha, and it's ready and ready to go. So your life is easier. You can focus on your app, but then you have all the control to go in and start kind of learning how to manage the back end of the system on a hosting environment. Works great. Love it. Excellent. We have time, it looks like, for a couple more questions, or maybe at least one more. And the question is, is it possible to make a UX component look like a tabbed UI component? In other words, a UX that's got buttons on the left side in a non-changing area, and then when you click on them, it opens up something on the right side. Yes, you can. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to try this. So this is uh, off the cuff here. Right, yep. Gonna make so we have our UX builder. builder. Uh, you know what? Actually, I can't do justice in three, four minutes, and that's a great question. Okay. Um, so can we do that next week? And I promise I'll, I'll do that first thing off as the demo. Okay. Um, 
I want to do it justice. I don't want to do it real quick and then you know leave people hanging. Uh, it's a fabulous question. It's actually really doable with panels and uh, what are called dynamic panels, which are very slick. So I'll get it ready and have a little demo for us next week that that really will do justice to that question. Excellent. So thank you, whoever that was. Um, another question. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand it, but we'll give it a shot. So he wants to build a dynamic grid where the user, user chooses stores, uh, chooses stores how many rows and how many columns per row. For example, columns could be four, five, and seven. Each cell would be a small image link or a small amount of editable data. I am sorry, I'm not making heads or tails out of that question. No, no, I kind of know what they're going there. Oh, really? Um, okay, good. Yeah, it's that's a tricky thing. Um, there's two ways to approach this. You can either do it with a grid or a uh, a list component. Now, the trade offs are the grid component's kind of a fixed gross. When you say I want X number of columns, that X number of columns are set up. Now, there's a few tricks when you load the grid to be able to hide columns, uh, but not really change the nature of those columns. So there's some tricks around that. Now, the downside is that grids. Uh, you know, if you go down that road, you're kind of being more of a web desktop, not really a mobile app. Now, the cool thing with a UX or a list control is that you have a much more, you have many, many more capable ways of laying out. In fact, list controls can have literally multiple views of the list at any one time. So you could have a list control where you have one view of three, another view of five, another view of seven. And you can dynamically select those literally on the fly with data and everything else there. So there's a bit of a kind of if you want edit in place, meaning you want to be able to show like an edit box, then you're going to have to stay with grids because grids have built-in edit boxes. But if you're willing to say, for instance, create a list where you touch on an item and then it opens up an edit box to the right where you can then update the field, that's probably your best bet. List gives you a lot more controls over sort of your look and feel and behavior, especially at runtime, whereas grids are kind of thinking more of like these fixed beasts that were really meant to be, okay, I'm showing these rows, these columns, you can edit, there's a lot of power, it does all these things for you, but you don't have a lot of control over dynamically modifying that while it's running or before it runs. You have some of it, but not much, uh, whereas a list, you can do that. And when you see at the new upcoming um, Alpha Developers Conference, the new clipboard capability, the list control becomes even more powerful because you can do some really cool things with, if you touch an item in a list, it could actually present one of many different editing interfaces for the user. So literally, for instance, like that example, if you had a list item that was numeric, it would open up a little numeric text box that you can type into. If it's a image, you could open it up and it could literally let you touch on an image to select what that image is. And that's all built into the new technology there. So I'd have to know a little bit more about what you're trying to do there, but my gut feels I would probably lean, to, lean towards list controls because then you have these super dynamic capabilities. And more importantly, if you're planning on going mobile, you're going to want to be on a list control versus a grid because it's just going to behave. It's going to be smaller, lighter, faster, and much better behaved when you're out in the mobile world. So I hope that's helpful in terms of a pointer. That is great. Uh, let's see. We've got about 90 seconds left. That should be enough. Okay. I got a shout question. out. Bill, thanks for joining us. Bill Anderson, great developer, doing some phenomenal stuff. Andy, doing also incredible things from the access world. We love it. And also, I, I, it, don't take offense, but I was looking at the group of attendees that were on, and it, there was Harry L. Porter. And initially, I thought it was Harry Potter. And I was like, oh, my God. what? A, you know, we're really starting to hit the big time there. <laughs> so, uh, Harry, I kind of missed up your name when I first saw it. But thanks for joining us, all of you. We really, really appreciate you spending time with us. Yeah. And we love doing this and love your questions and really want you to be successful with what you're doing with Alpha. Great. One last question. Um, this going back to the notifications uh, stuff that you were doing earlier. Uh, the question is, would it be possible to use that technique that you showed us in the UX to alert mobile users that there's new data available for them to download into their application? Absolutely. That's exactly what you would do is um, there's two ways to approach that. Uh, you could use that same idea. And the idea behind it is that on your uh, just if I were to do it off the top of my head, I would say, OK, what's the count of rows that I have? You know, like a simple way of understanding if the data has changed. And then in that UX callback, I can query the database and say, hey, am I at the same row count? Has that row count changed? Is there new data available? Even like a web service. 
and then you send a notification back to the user by basically saying, okay, here's your new data and then flag that icon to come up. And then what I would do is on the icon itself, I would uh, press like uh, if it's like an icon where new data is available, you could then set a little action JavaScript where they click on that and it immediately fires off a synchronized event for all your list to bring down the latest data for you. Now, if you go phone gap, there's actually a full notifications uh, API that's a lot more sophisticated than what I did where it, it will actually run even when the app is not in the foreground. So it's more like, you know, if you have your phone and you get notifications that you got an email or this or that, that would work more. So PhoneGap is even more effective on that. But if you're right, you could just use this current technique where every once in a while it checks the back end system and says, oh, you know what, you got new data, let's refresh our lists to, to make sure that what I have on the disconnected mobile app is the most current data. So great idea. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dion. Thank you, everyone who attended. We had a great group today. Um, we hope to see you on a future webinar. Of course, if you have any other questions, please feel free to send an email to iGMLSoftware.com. Uh, you got to work on your DJ skills there, pal. I'm sorry. I'm having an issue with the, uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Take care, guys. Bye.